Um, so today we're going to be in Luke 15. Uh, we're going to be starting in verse 11 and going all the way to verse 32. In verse 11, we're going to start. And so um, it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want to share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide, divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About that time, his money ran out. A great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods, which is like, you know, the sloth that the pigs eat, which is disgusting, um, he was feeding the pigs, looked so good to him, but no one gave anything to him. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him, his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost and now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, he, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Um, so I would, um, you know, I was reading over those verses, and um, God spoke to me um, as a mother. We, um, we happen to do this thing as mothers where we like to, um, <laughs> we like to try to save our own kids, right? Um, but the reality is that we all have a prodigal heart. Um, within us, um, ourselves and our children and anyone that's living on this world because of the wicked and evilness that's living within us that we were born with. And so we all have that prodigal son's heart that wants us to run away. Um, but we as mothers don't need to get in the way of what God is trying to do. Um, instead of trying to get in the way, we need to allow God to work. And um, like Tisha was talking about earlier, we need to get on our knees as moms and we need to be praying moms because that's the only difference that's going to truly be made in our kids' lives. It's nothing that we can do. It's only what God and Jesus Christ can do in their hearts and their minds. We've been talking about, if this is your first time here in a while or first time ever, uh, you found us in a series called Dangerous Prayers. While we recognize here at Freedom Family Church, we recognize that the Bible does say that that it's okay to have a certain selfish element to our prayer life where we cast our cares upon the Lord, knowing that he cares upon us. We cast our anxiety on the Lord, knowing that he cares for us. We, we cry out to God and we talk about our needs and our wants, our desires. He, the Bible talks about him granting the desires of our heart. So there's nothing wrong with that self, selfish element to prayer. 
But what we've recognized is that there's supposed to be more. There's more to prayer than just you and I talking about what we want and what we need. We learned last week that prayer is supposed to be a two-way street where, yes, we cry out to God, yes, we pray to God, but He also answers us, and He also tells us things that we never would have thought of on our own. By the way, if you want to know if you truly have a biblical prayer life, are there times that you come up with stuff? There are, are there times that you think of stuff that you're sitting there going, wow, that has got to be a God thing because I'm not that smart. If that's not happening to you, what te- that tells me is that you basically have a one-way prayer life where all you're doing is whining and complaining and talking to God about what you want, but you never slow down long enough to listen and to recognize His voice. And so we've been talking about dangerous prayers, prayers like, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my way, see if there's any wickedness within me, and lead me on the path everlasting. We talked about last week where, where Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Wow, what a dangerous prayer that was. But today, I was like, okay, God, it's Mother's Day, let's, let's do something different. And God's like, no, 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 no. It's so funny, I don't know about you, but I grew up at a time where Southern Gospel was really big and really important. Even when I lived in Bear Creek, North Carolina, surrounded by Bon Lee and Bennett, you got people that would never go to church, but if you had a Southern Gospel concert, buddy, you could fill the church. Now, they wouldn't come here preaching. They definitely wouldn't be held accountable, but, buddy, if you played Southern Gospel, in fact, there was a certain Hardee's around here that they made their business on having Southern Gospel concerts, all right? And I don't know if you've ever been to a Southern Gospel concert, but in, if you've ever heard a Southern Gospel song, it's going to talk about one or two things. It's going to talk about the sweet by and by, Beulah Land, right? Or it's going to talk about my praying mama, my praying mama, my praying grandma. She did without apple pie, so she could pray, you know? But what I noticed and what God reminded me this week is while there was a time where our, the institution and the job of mother revolved around prayer. Yes, they did a lot of other things physically, but every mother, every grandmother recognized that their primary duty, their primary responsibility was to pray for their children, was to pray for their grandchildren, was to pray for their nieces, to pray for their nephews. They recognized, back then, they recognized that we have a whole generation of mothers. In fact, we're probably on a whole generation of grandmothers that If they pray more than five minutes a day for their children, their grandchildren, their nieces, and their nephews, then they're above average. We've got a whole generation of moms that don't recognize that your job is not to get up before your kids so that you can have some me time. Your job is to get up before your kids so that you can pray for them. Your job is not to go to bed after your kids so that you can have some me time and you can Netflix and chill. Your job is to go to bed after your kids so that you can pray for them. That the primary responsibility and duties of a biblical mom is to pray. In fact, not only just pray, not just pray that now I lay me down to sleep, God is great, God is good, but mothers are called to pray dangerous prayers for their children. The most threatening, ooh, you might want to write this down, the most threatening a mother will ever be will be on her knees in prayer. The most scared that the demons that are attacking your children and your grandchildren the most scared the demons will be is when, you're, when a mother and a grandmother is on their knees in prayer. You're saying, Randy, why is it so important? Why is it so important for me as a mom? Why is it so important for me as a, as a grandma? Why is it so important for me as an aunt? Why is it so important for me to pray? Well, because of this fact. Notice this fact, and the fact is this. The law of the harvest is never more real than with mothers. The law of the harvest... Is never more real than with mothers. Now, some of you are saying, Randy, what in the world is the law of the harvest? You may call it karma. You may call it whatever. But the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, it says, people harvest only what they plant. If they plant to satisfy their sinful self, their sinful selves will bring them ruin. But if they plant to please the Spirit, they will receive eternal life from the Spirit. So the law of the harvest, simply put, is this. If you do good, you'll get good. If you'll do bad, you'll get bad. That's the law of the harvest. And you, and whether you know it or not, God has ordered the universe that we will reap what we sow. God has 
ordered the way the laws of the universe work to where everything works and centers around the law of the harvest. Now, you're saying, Randy, what has that got to do with moms? All right, hear me. Imagine every mom that's here, every grandma that's here, every aunt that's here. Ready? Imagine them as children and as teenagers. Now, what the Bible is saying is every mom, every grandma, every aunt in here, if they were rebellious, if they were liars, if they were lustful, if they were fearful, if they were selfish, whatever, you fill in the blank, that whatever sinfulness they exhibited as a child and as a teenager, their kids will often be the tool that God uses to bring about their harvest. You see, nobody told you that, did they? Nobody told me when I, that, that 17-year-old Randy would be harming Naomi, who's three. Nobody told me that. And I guarantee you that most of you did not realize that what you did as a teenager, how you acted as a child, is affecting your children and your grandchildren today. Now, here's the thing that some of you, you're, you're arguing with me. You're saying, well, Randy, that's not fair. Randy, I didn't know that. And since I didn't know that, it shouldn't happen. You do realize that gravity is gravity whether you realize it or not. Gravity happens whether you believe in it or not. Gravity is a reality whether you're aware of it or not. And you do realize that you don't get to choose your consequences. You see, that's what, nobody told me this. Nobody taught me this. I, I, I'm firmly convinced if somebody would have taught 17-year-old Randy that, hey, if you don't watch it, 30 years from now, your sweet little girl is going to have to pay. They're going to be punished for what you're doing. I'm very hopeful that 17-year-old Randy would not have been nearly the knucklehead that he is now because he loved Naomi. And so, why is the law of the harvest never more real than mothers? Why? Because what you did then is affecting your children now. In fact, there's a truth that's even worse than that, and the truth is this. Dealing with generational curses is the hardest part of being a mom. Dealing with generational curses is the hardest part of being a mom. May I suggest something to you? That one sin or that one area of frustration that your children are constantly aggravating you with, that one area of, uh, uh, in your kid's life, in your grandkid's life, in your niece and nephew's life, that one area that drives you nuts, that causes you the greatest heartache and causes you the greatest pain, might I suggest that it comes from a generational curse? You're saying, Randy, what do you mean by a generational curse? Well, in the Ten Commandments, you know, that thing that all of you people like to get on Facebook and talk about how it needs to be in every courtroom, that we need to have the Ten Commandments in, in, in every classroom around the nation. We got to have the Ten Commandments, got to have the Ten Commandments. It's amazing that we want the Ten Commandments everywhere, but we don't know what it says. Because smack dab in the middle of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 25, it says this, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You're saying, Randy, I don't hate God. Make sure you understand what the definition of hate is. The definition of hate is to be an enemy, a rival, or to be disgusted by. Notice what Psalm 81.15 says. It's the same word for hate. It says, those who hate the Lord would pretend submission to him. So what's he saying there? He's saying every time our moms pretended to obey God, but didn't really, then guess what? They were bringing a generational curse down upon their kids, their grandkids, and their great-grandkids. Think about, do you do realize you may have just planted a generational curse in your kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids? Because I saw many of you singing to the Lord. You, you lifted your hands, and you were praying to the Lord. What were you doing? You were pretending to be in submission to Him. But guess what? He knew, and you knew, that you have known sin in your life that you have no intention of dealing with. Then the Bible says you were hating God there and you were planting a generational curse in your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. You do realize every time you said, I'm a Christian, 
Which, by the way, what does the word Christian mean? When you declare that I am a Christian, you are saying that I act like Christ. Every time you said, I'm a Christian, without living like Jesus, what were you doing? The Bible says in Psalm 81, 15, that you were what? Hating God, and you were planting a generational curse in your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Every time, for example, you do understand the context of Exodus 25 is idolatry. What's an idol? An idol is anything or anyone you put above God. That's the context of that verse. And so every time our mothers, every time our fathers, every time our grandparents, every time our great-grandparents, every time they put something or someone, whether it be food, sex, drink, whatever, Every time we put something or someone before God, we're hating God, according to the Bible, and we're planting a generational curse in our kid's life. Are you beginning to understand why I say that one of the hardest parts of being a mom, one of the hardest parts of being a parent, is dealing with the generational curses that we have put on our kids? And that leads us to this reality. And the reality is, why do we need to pray dangerous prayer for our kids? Because of this reality. Most parents have raised a prodigal child. Most parents have raised a prodigal child. Remember the story that Courtney just read to us from Luke chapter 15 about the prodigal son. Notice what's said in verse 13. It said, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. What do we mean by prodigal? And you hear the word prodigal. What is prodigal? You ready? The definition of prodigal is wasteful, reckless, and wild living. First Peter 4, 4 talks about it too. He says, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things that they do. What's he saying there? That your friends are shocked that you're not as prodigal as you used to be. You're not as reckless. You're not as wasteful. You're not as wild as you used to be. And so, because of the law of the harvest, because of generational curses, most of us have raised or are raising a prodigal child. You say, I don't know if I believe you. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a kid or a grandkid, niece, nephew? Do you have a kid that you know they're smart, but they're doing poorly in school? What are they doing? They're wasting their God-given intelligence. The Bible says that's a prodigal heart. Do you have a kid that doesn't take care of their stuff, doesn't take care of their room, doesn't take care of their clothes, doesn't take care of their body? The Bible says that's a prodigal heart. Do you have a kid that's constantly disobeying? The word wild means what? They're all, always trying to color outside the line. They're always trying to disobey the rules. They're, if you tell them something, you know, for example, if you tell them something, they're going to try their best not to do it. That's a prodigal heart. And so that's why I say most of us have or are raising prodigal children. Now, please remember, because some of you are thinking, well, Randy, my kids aren't in a far country. I wish they were in a far country some days, but my kids aren't in a far country. I'd, I, I would gladly give them all of their inheritance so they can leave. Remember, they don't have to leave to be a prodigal. They don't have to leave to be a prodigal. Notice 1 Samuel 2, 22 and 25. It says the high priest, the, the head pastor, Eli, Heard about everything his sons were doing, how they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the church. His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke. What was happening there? They were prodigal boys living with their daddy, living with church. So they don't have to leave to be a prodigal. And so how do, how should a mom respond to her prodigal? How should we respond to the prodigals in our life? Hear me. I recognize, I was reminding again yesterday, many of you have prodigal parents. You got parents that are, re that are reckless and they're wasteful. If you got a parent or a grandparent that refuses to spend time with their grandkids, they're wasting the, the innocence and the, the wonder of their grandchildren. You got a prodigal parent. You got, a, you got a parent that lives 20 minutes away. Will drive through Liberty. Drive right past your house. 
and not come by to see you, you got a prodigal parent. You got a parent or a grandparent that has the opportunity and privilege to worship with you every Sunday. And they refuse and they waste the privilege. They waste the opportunity to worship with their children and their grandchildren. You have a prodigal parent. So how do we respond? How should we respond? Well, here's the thing. The beauty is Jesus didn't just tell that story so you could feel good about yourself. Jesus tells us in that story the steps that we are to take, the things that we are to do. He tells us how we should respond to the prodigals in our life. Yes, it talks mainly about a kid, but it could also be the other. Anybody else that's wasteful, reckless, and wild in your life. How do we respond? How should a mom respond to her prodigal? Well, number one, we see our job is to pray for and allow their loss and lack. Our job is to pray for and allow the prodigals in our lives loss and lack. Go back to verses 14 and 16 of Luke 15. It says, his money ran out. But no one gave him anything. His daddy didn't send him no money. His mama didn't swoop in. His grandparents didn't bail him out. No one gave him anything. What is he doing? Those verses show the first step in God's plan to bring a prodigal back to him is to pray for and allow God to take away their support through people and things. I have found that most prodigals can't sin without help. And that leads us to this fact, and the fact is this. The biblical response to ongoing, please underline that word ongoing, because some of you are going to mess up by making this say something that it's not. But the biblical response to ongoing, continual, habitual sin is isolation. The biblical response to ongoing sin is isolation. Proverbs 15, 29 says this, The Lord is far from the wicked. What happens? He's saying that if Tara decides that she's going to wake up and she's going to continually and she's going to habitually and she's going to consistently sin and be in sin, then guess what? The Lord is far from her. He even goes on to say he doesn't even answer her prayers. And he says the same thing about us. That's our job too. That 2 Thessalonians 3.14 says this, Take note of those who refuse to obey the Bible. Stay away from them so that they will be ashamed. Now remember, Our job as parents, our job as Christians, our job as people of God is to act like Jesus. Well, Jesus is far away from those who are wasteful, reckless, and wild. So let me give you this. You can write it down if you want to. Let me tell you what I pray for the prodigals in my life. You ready? Oh God, remove anything or anyone that helps them sin. Oh God, remove anything or anyone that helps them sin. And then, by the way, after I pray that, I get off of my knees. After I pray, I make sure that I'm not the one supporting their sin. I make sure those under my authority are not supporting their sin. And so the first step is what? We pray for and allow their loss and lack. But notice number two. We see this in our text. We we are to pray for and allow their destruction and distress. We are to pray for and allow their destruction and distress. Verse 14 says this, A great famine swept through the land, and he began to starve. What's happening there? Well, we see the second step of God's plan of bringing the prodigal back to him. And then the second step is to bring massive devastation and pain into their lives. I don't know if you know much about the story. It was the prodigal's bodily desires that got him into that trouble. So when you see the word starve, what was God doing? Bringing destruction down upon the bodily desires that led him into sin to begin with. And so that leads us to this truth. And the truth is this. God removes the gifts that are more important than the giver. God removes the gifts. Gifts like health. Gifts like wealth. Gifts like relationships, gifts like connections, gifts like intimacy and love and kindness. God removes the gifts that are more important than the giver. You do understand all of those things that I just listed. They are God's good gifts to point us to him. 
But if we ever worship a relationship, if we ever worship a child, if we ever worship a parent, if we ever worship a spouse, if we ever worship anything that God's given us to point him to him, then he's going to bring destruction down upon it. I see it in Jeremiah 8.13. It says, God says, I will surely consume their property. Whatever I gave them will soon be gone. You see, when the prodigals choose to worship the gifts of God, he, the law of the harvest, results in the destruction of those gifts. And so how do I pray? First step, first thing I prayed was, oh God, remove anything or anyone that helps their sin. The second thing that I pray, you might want to write this down, is I pray, oh God, destroy every tool of their sin in their life. Destroy every tool of sin in their lives. And then guess what? I make sure. I make sure that the things that I give them are not being used for sin. That's why I don't understand. You've got disobedient, rebellious children. Why do they still have a phone that you pay for? Why do they still have any devices at all? Why do they still have why are they still able to go six weeks without wearing the same outfit? Why? Why are you allowing the good gifts that you give them to become their idol and bring destruction upon their life? I hear teenage parents all the time saying, I just don't know what to do with that boy. I just don't know what to do with that girl. While that boy is sitting there looking at his Apple Watch on his iPad, driving his car that's under their insurance. Really? This is free. I won't charge you. When they reject you, they reject your blessings as well. When they reject you, they reject your blessings as well. And I'm definitely, you see, one day I'm going to be judged by how I tempted my children to sin or I tempted my children to worship. And I'll be daggum if I'm going to stand before a holy God and be judged by giving my kids the tools of their destruction and paying for it. Are you kidding me? So we pray for and allow their loss and lack. We pray for and allow their destruction and distress. But notice number three, we pray for and allow their shame and humiliation. We pray for and allow their shame and humiliation. Notice what verses 15 and 16 says. Now notice, some of you are already mad at me, but you tell me where I'm getting this from anywhere but Scripture. By the way, if your way of handling your prodigal worked, it would have already been done. Why don't we try God's way? Notice what verses 15 and 16 says. It said, the prodigal persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods, I mean the slop, he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. Now you might not know it, but the ultimate disgrace for any Jew was pigs. There was no better shame. There was more, no more humiliation to, be, to touching and being around and taking care of pigs. They were the worst of the worst, according to the Jews. And so this guy reveals the third step in God's plan to save every prodigal, and that is to create within them a disgust and hatred for their sin. You see, God has got to. You want to know why you haven't given up your pet sin? You want to know why you keep sinning in your pet way? It's because you haven't gotten disgusted by it. You haven't become ashamed of it. And so the, the next step that God does is he creates within us he, a, a disgust and a hatred for our sin. And that leads us to the fact, and the fact is this, the end result, the way God has set things up, the end result of all idolatry is shame. The end result of all idolatry is shame. Notice the Isaiah 45, 16 promise. It says, those who make idols will be ashamed and disgraced. They will go complete, they will go away completely disgraced. So guess what? If kids become your idol, you will be ashamed and disgraced by your kids. If food becomes your idol, you will be ashamed and disgraced by your food. If sex becomes your idol, you will become disgraced and ashamed by sex. If work becomes your idol, then you will become disgraced and ashamed by your work. Any idol leads to shame. You're saying, Randy, why is God so harsh? Well, as I shared with you earlier, 
God knows that there's worse things than shame. God knows that generational curses are much worse than a season of shame. God knows that the law of the harvest is much worse than a season of shame. I wish I would have gone through six weeks of shame so that Naomi and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren shouldn't have to suffer. Why is God being harsh? Because he loves your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren too. And so we, we've got to allow God to bring about shame and disgust. So this is how I pray. Again, I've just been telling you my heart's prayer. If you become a prodigal, by the way, this is what I'm praying for you. I have a specific time every week that I pray against the prodigals. And this is what I pray. Oh God, throw them into the pig pen of shame and humiliation. Oh God, whatever it takes. You know them. You know their heart. You know their background. God, whatever it takes to, to cause them to be humiliated and shamed by their sin. God, what are you going to do? Because this is what I have found. Why would I pray that for you? Because I have found that when we hate our sin, we stop our sin. You want to stop being a glutton? Ask God to give you a hatred for it. You want to stop doing whatever it is that you can't stop? Ask God to give you a hatred. I had a young man text me this week, said, Pastor, how do I stop looking at porn? Ask God to give you a hatred for it. See that as somebody's wife. See that as somebody's daughter. And see if you don't get disgusted. And so what do we do? We pray for and allow their loss and lack. We pray for and allow their destruction and distress. We pray for and allow their shame and humiliation. But notice, we also pray for and allow their true repentance. We pray for and allow their true repentance. Verse 17 gives us a wonderful picture of repentance. It says, when he finally came to his senses. What does that mean? He's given us the fourth step for God delivering our, our, our prodigal, and that is a change of mind. You see, God uses loss, destruction, and shame to get our heads right. You're saying, Randy, why is it so important for us to get our heads right? Why? Because always remember, remember, all change starts in the mind. All change. You want to know why your kid hadn't changed? Their mind hadn't changed. You want to know why your grandkid's still doing the same stupid stuff? Their mind hadn't changed. All change. You want to know why you are you? You haven't changed your mind. Notice what Psalm 119.59 says. I pondered the direction of my life and I turned to follow your laws. Now, what does he mean by pondered? It means to think, to account, and to plan out. Okay, let's apply this to the story. So what happened is while he was sitting in the pig pen, what, what happened while he was wanting to eat some slop, what did he do? He thought about his sin. He counted the pros and the cons. And he changed the way he thought about what made him happy. And our job is to pray for and allow that God will use their shame, their loss, their destruction to cause them to change the way they think and to change the way they act. In fact, can I tell you, I'm begging some of you, hear me. I'm begging you, Grandma. I'm begging you, Mama. I'm begging you, hear me. Please stop sabotaging their repentance. Can I tell you one way that you know somebody's under repentance? They're depressed. One of the ways you know somebody's under repentance is they say things like, I hate my life. I hate where I'm at. And what do we do as parents? What do we do as parents? Oh, no, 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 no. And we talk them out of their repentance. We tell them everything's going to be okay. It ain't going to be okay if they don't change. And, and, and they're, 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 they're feeling bad. They're feeling depressed. They're going through a season of discouragement and despair. And you're trying to make it better. You're buying them stuff. You're bailing them out. No, stop. In fact, some of you, when they look at you and they say, oh, I'm so discouraged. Oh, I'm so depressed. You need to inside start going, why? Because that means God's at work. That means God's doing his job. And you don't, 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 don't on your face. But inside, you're like, yes, yes, yes. You're depressed. Don't take a Xanax. Keep being depressed because you won't change until you deal with your depression. Because depression equals repentance in a lot, of time, a lot of cases. And so we do what? We pray for and allow their loss and lack. We pray for and allow their destruction and distress. We pray for and allow their shame and humiliation. We pray for and allow their true repentance. But, oh, please don't stop. Some of you are so close to getting your prodigals back. 
Some of you are so close to having your kid back. Some of you are so close to getting your grandkid back. Some of you are so close, but you got to do number five. You got to pray for and allow their true confession. You got to pray for and allow their true confession. Notice what true repentance looks like. Our prodigal's repentance led him to verse 21. He says, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. That's the fifth step of, of restoration for our sinners. Uh, that's when they agree with God about their sin and themselves. Notice what he said. He said, hey, I sinned against God first because all sin is against God first. If you think that your kid's sin is against you first, you're full of it, and you are not God. True repentance causes them to say, hey, you know what? I've sinned against God, but he says what? I've also sinned against my family. And the result of that sin is that, hey, I'm worthless. Did you hear that? He said that. He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me a slave. Just make me an employee. I am not worthy. I am worthless. Why? Because of the sin, the ongoing sin in my life has made me worthless. He confessed his sin. You're saying, Randy, why is that so important for them to say that what they sinned against God and me and, and, and that they're worthless? Why? Because of this truth. There is no healing without confession. There is no healing. Notice what James 5.16 says. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Why have you not been healed from your sin? When have you confessed? Notice what Proverbs 28, 13 says. It says people who conceal their sins, those people who act like they haven't sinned, you know, those people who are horrible and no good and they blow up the family and then they just show up at Christmas and act like everything's okay. You know who I'm talking about? Some of you got parents like that. They treat you like with contempt. They treat you like crap. They're selfish and they're needy and they're all this. But then Mother's Day comes along. Father's Day comes along. Christmas comes along and they act like everything's okay. Well, notice what Proverbs 28, 13 says. It says, people who conceal their sin will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Right on that line, that word confess, it means to agree with God. Confess means to agree with God. And if you confess and combine that confession with prayer, you get mercy and healing. Please, again, do me another favor. Stop talking your, your, your prodigal out of confession. Stop it. When they come to you and say, I am a, a sorry, no good sack of snot. Don't say, oh, no, you're precious. No, they're not. If they've been in ongoing, continual sin, they have brought pain and destruction and devastation down upon your family. They are not precious. And you don't need to stop them when they come and say, hey, you know what? I've sinned against the holy God. Don't say, well, God loves you. I, they know God loves them. That's the only reason they're not dead. But they've still sinned against the holy God. And I've sinned against you, Mom. I've sinned against you, Dad. And guess what? Because of my ongoing sin, because of my unrepentance, because of the, 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 the horribleness that's in my life, I'm not worthy. I'm worthless. Some of you are like this little lady at my gym. Y'all know my saying because, you know, I think I've been honest enough. Nobody argues with me around, about this around here. But I walked into the gym the other day and I said, she said, how you doing, Mr. Hand? And I said, better than I deserve. And she goes, oh, no, stop saying that. You can't say that. I was like, girl, you don't know me. You don't know the violence that was in my heart as I was walking into this parking lot when that person threw their trash down in front of me. You're saying, why, why were you violent? Because I was that guy in my teens, and now God has said, my consequence is I get to pick up other people's trash in the, in the parking lot. And so I'm walking into the gym, and my back's hurting, my legs hurt, my knees hurt, my arms hurt, everything's hurt. And I'm walking in, and there's a piece of trash in the parking lot, and God's like, son, get that. I was like, I don't, uh, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. You throw another lottery ticket down on the parking lot, I'm going to murder you and your children. You don't know me. So yes, I'm breathing. I've got $10 in my pocket with four kids. What a miracle that is. I am definitely better than I deserve. 
Why? Because see, once you've been a prodigal, like me, the BS has been ripped off. I see myself for who I am. You want to know why some of you are going to bust tail wide open? Because you ain't never seen yourself for who you really are. And if you ain't never seen yourself for who you really are, you've never confessed. And if you've never confessed, there is no forgiveness. Some of y'all are on dangerous ground right now. So what do I pray? I'm like, oh God, bring them to their senses and give them the courage to tell the truth. And so that's step number five. We pray for and allow their confession. But there's one last thing. And this is what's going to make a difference in Christmas. This is what's going to make a difference at Thanksgiving. This is what's going to make a difference. You ready? The, don't miss this last step. And when it comes to your prodigal, we pray for and encourage the rest of the family. You've had a prodigal in your life. You've had a prodigal that's, that's called pain and heartache and destruction, embarrassment, humiliation, shame. Now, not upon them, not, not only them, but the whole family. Well, notice verses 20 and 28. I'm so glad that Jesus continued. He put this in the story. It talks about the father's response. It says, filled with love and compassion, the father ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. But notice, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. There's typically two responses to those who are left behind by the prodigal. One is the dad. Woohoo! Kill the fat calf, whatever. Get him a new shirt. Put some Nikes on him. And then there's, I ain't want nothing to do with them. They sinned against me. They sinned against my daddy. They sinned against my family. No. So don't miss the final step for the return of our prodigals. You see, the healing process must include the ones hurt the most. And some of you, you're, you're like I used to be, and you get real mad at the older brother because you know you're a prodigal and you really want everybody to respond like the daddy, but you know there's a lot of older brothers out there. God changed my mind about them. This is what he told me. That older brother was paralyzed by anger. He would not go in. He was paralyzed. He was stuck. He was stuck by the sin that his little brother had done. He was stuck. Trust me, I've got two brothers. i got one who loves me dearly, would take a bullet for me. i got another one who's still stuck with 13-year-old Randy. And so that leads us to the reality. And the reality is this. Our families have no future without forgiveness. Your family has no, no future without forgiveness. You see, here's God's method for responding to our prodigals. It's found in Ephesians 4.32. It says, Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Please do me a favor. Underline that last part, as God through Christ has forgiven you. Some of you get stuck on the forgiving one another, but never miss the why of forgiveness. The reason why we forgive is not because they deserve it. The reason why we forgive is not because we're awesome people. The reason why we forgive is not because we want our families to be better. No, the reason we forgive and the only reason you'll ever truly forgive is if you forgive because God has forgiven you. Some of you have hurt me dearly and you know it and I know it. But every time you confess and every time you repent, what do I do? I hug you, I hold you. I take you back. And you think it's because I'm such an awesome person. It's not. You think it's because I love you so much. It's not. The reason why I forgive? It's because I've been forgiven so much. And I can't help but give to others what God has given to me. You want to know why you should forgive? You want to know why you should be like the father in this story and encourage your families to forgive like breathing? Listen, would you have sympathy on somebody in your family that was in a wheelchair? Would you have sympathy for somebody in your family that was paralyzed? Would you have sympathy for somebody in your family who was disabled? 
Well, unforgiveness disables us. Unforgiveness paralyzes us. Unforgiveness makes us stuck and we can't get out. And so the reason why we keep encouraging those in our life, the reason why we keep praying for those in our life to forgive like breathing is so they can quit being paralyzed by bitterness and anger and the past. In fact, why don't we start doing that now? Bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bow. Every eye closed. I, I got to ask you one question before we get to anything else. I know we've just... Opened up a whole lot there. And I know some of you, you are, you are Jones and you were, you were ready to get down to this altar so that you could pray for your prodigal. But before we do that, we got to answer this question. Are you the prodigal? Are you the prodigal that Jesus and others are praying for? Are you the prodigal? Have you dealt with your prodigal heart? That reckless, that have you, have you been reckless with your life? Have you been reckless with your relationships? Have you been reckless with your money? Have you been wasteful? Have you been not been a good steward of, of the life and the time that God's given you? If you've wasted time this week that you could have spent doing something good and you spent it on something stupid, you got a prodigal heart. And have you been wild? Have you seen every rule in your life as a challenge to get past and get beyond? Because you're awesome. You're great. And rules are for everybody else. They're not rule, the rules are not for me. Everybody else needs Jesus, not me. I'm great. Are you the prodigal? <laughs> Don't miss this. Wouldn't it stink for you to pray for others, prodigal heart, when you're sitting there smack dab in the middle of your pig pen? Has God used... Loss and destruction, shame and repentance to bring you to the point where you can confess today. Confess that I've sinned against God, I've sinned against others, and I am a worthless person. Are you the prodigal that needs to be saved? That needs to call upon the name of the Lord in the middle of your pig pen and have him reach down and pull you out? give you a new heart, a new life, and a new eternity. Are you the prodigal? Don't, don't rush past this. In fact, let's, let's pray. Dear God, I, I, I'm just praying. Oh, Lord, we're such a deluded and deceitful people. We, and the person we lie to the most is ourselves. God, give every person here the truth to deal with their prodigal heart. Oh God, I'm so thankful that, you want to, that you've given them the desire to pray for others. But Lord, may they pray for themselves right here, right now. May they confess their sin against heaven. May they confess their sin against others. May they confess that they are worthless and that all they have to give you is their sin. Oh God, I want them to be healed. I want them to find mercy. Oh, may they figure that out right now. And Lord, I'm perfectly okay if you don't let them pray for anybody else until they've settled everything with you. You know my ultimate desire is that we're going to be a praying people. That we're going to pray for the prodigals in our life that are either here or not here. But Lord, if they need to deal with their mess, let them deal with it. God, I love you. Thank you for never giving up on me, your chief prodigal. I am the prodigal of prodigals. I used to hate that story. Now I love it. Oh God, continue to be with us. It's in your name I pray.